Welcome to today's webinar episode of the Love Your Neighbor and Get Vaccinated series. And this is a particular subset of that series um, focused on back to school issues. And today we're really thrilled to have with us uh, to discuss the topic, Gen Z vaccine vaccination resistance, Jordan Trelins, a junior at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, and the founder of the COVID Campus Coalition, a nationwide group dedicated to timely and accurate information about vaccinations on college and university campuses. I'm David DeCoste, the Director of Religious and Catholic Ethics at the Markla Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. And I'm joined today by my fellow interviewer, uh, Amana Liddell, a senior at Santa Clara University a Hackworth Fellow at the Markula Center, and Amana has worked particularly on issues related to COVID and vaccination in under-resourced and African-American communities. So it's great to have Amana with me as a fellow interviewer. And this whole series is co-sponsored by the Markula Center and by Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County. So we'll hear in a moment from Jordan about her own work and the founding of the COVID Campus Coalition. But first we wanted to just get a little context setting. So Amana, could you share your slides please? And we'll take a look at some vaccination issues pertaining to the young. Okay, so here's one chart uh, and vaccination data by age. And we can see, I mean, Gen Z is thought to be like six to 24. So that's our broader range although we're focusing a little more today on kind of college and university, but we can see some pretty telling numbers there in terms of under 18, uh, at least one dose in the United States, under 18 fully vaccinated, the numbers are pretty low. They get larger as the age group goes up to 18 to 24 and get much larger as the age groups get higher than that. So let's remember also um, that, uh, the vaccines have been approved. Vaccines have been approved for everyone from 12 and up. So uh, that is the age group that is eligible for vaccination. Okay, Amana, thank you so much. That's the US. Let's maybe drill down a little. We're in California. Our conversation is about the country, but since we're here in California, take a little closer look at these numbers. And so California doing a little better than across the country. It looks like... <laughs> So under 18 still just short of 20% with one dose and under 18 uh, just south of 15% fully vaccinated. Okay, great. So that just gives us a sense of things. So Jordan, looking at those numbers, like what jumps out to you from your work in the last year on the matter of COVID and vaccination? I think from those charts, it's pretty evident that Gen Z and younger individuals are far less vaccinated as of now when compared to older individuals or more of just the middle-aged individuals in our country as a whole and even on a state-to-state -state basis. And so this is exactly what my group is trying to target. We've noticed this hesitancy and I personally did see it coming a bit early on in the vaccine rollout. And that's really what encouraged me to start this campaign and this coalition. Great, Jordan. And could you comment at all on, you know, we're living right now in sort of the next kind of terrible phase, the Delta phase of the pandemic. Has that affected your thinking at all about those, that data we've just seen? You know, I do think that the Delta variant has altered the way that young individuals are viewing COVID vaccines. On one hand, because so many less young individuals are vaccinated, we're seeing more young individuals getting severely ill from COVID and actually being hospitalized right now, which is devastating. On the other hand, we're also seeing the Delta variant, you know, not fully being 100% covered by the vaccine. There are some breakthrough cases, and I think some young individuals are misinterpreting those breakthrough cases and it's causing them to be even more hesitant to getting vaccinated because they don't fully understand all of the benefits and just how effective these vaccines are. So I think we're seeing 
some of both impacting the way that young individuals are viewing vaccines because of the Delta variant. Jordan, it's general question. Uh, can someone presume I'm young, I'm fine, I don't need the vaccine? Right, I think that's unfortunately the biggest issue that we're seeing now in young individuals. And I think the biggest thing that's preventing young people from getting vaccinated is exactly that mindset that we're young, healthy and invincible. But really that's not the case. And we are seeing with the Delta variant that while it's still rare, young individuals can get severely ill from COVID-19. But even more importantly, we're seeing how when not enough people get vaccinated, and that includes young individuals, variants do emerge and the virus mutates. And so until we reach herd immunity, which will require enough young people to get vaccinated, there's the potential for more variants to form, which puts others at risk as well, not just young individuals themselves. Jordan, thank you so much. So, and Amana, thank you for sharing the slides and all. And so that really puts us in a bit of context here. Okay, Jordan, so let's go back, you know, a year or however it was, you're there at Cornell, you're seeing this all stuff starting to play out. Why did you form the COVID Campus Coalition and what's happened since with the coalition? So early in the COVID vaccine rollout around the end of December and early January, I actually noticed first on my TikTok and eventually also on my Instagram account that I was not seeing any factual information circulating about COVID vaccines at that time. In fact, I was seeing a lot of the opposite, conspiracy theories, misinformation, and situations taken out of context. And that really got me thinking that most young people don't typically spend their free time sifting through scientific literature to determine how they feel about COVID vaccines. They look at what's on their social media and that impacts the way that they feel. And so after I recognized that on my social media, I created an Instagram account to provide students at my university with factual information about COVID vaccines from reliable sources like the World Health Organization, New England Journal of Medicine, the CDC. And I would present the information in clear, bright infographics on Instagram and then also in video format on TikTok. And after just starting at my own university, Cornell University, and seeing students repost my graphics, share their graphics with their friends and family, I really saw that just how effective the model was. And it got me thinking that there must be other students across the country also hoping to share factual information with students at their universities. So from that initial account, we have now expanded into 40 other universities each university has at least one student ambassador that runs their own COVID Campus Coalition account and circulates graphics that we provide. All of our graphics are customized to fit the school name and school color of each university to really best engage students. And it's been incredible to see how many students out there really want to fight vaccine hesitancy and provide other students with the facts so that hopefully more people can understand the safety and efficacy of COVID vaccines. Well, that's great. Now I want to turn it over to Amana here for a question because she is, I know, an undergraduate who does like reading all the medical and public health data about vaccinations. But Amana, over to you. Yes, I think that's kind of a great model for kind of reaching college students because really that's somewhere where everyone already is. And if you're meeting people where they're already looking at different things, maybe that's not particularly where they're looking for information about COVID, but that's where they're going to find it, whether it's true or not. And it's important that um, as we're consuming this true information in from the CDC and medical journals and things like that, that we're presenting those to others who might not be looking at those specific sources. And so I think kind of sharing that is a great way to combat, combat this vaccine hesitancy that we're seeing in Gen Z just by meeting people where they already are. Absolutely, I agree. Um, Jordan, can I ask, so d this began, it sounds like, with was it just you thinking, I'm frustrated, I never see, or what I see seems, you know, palpably untrue, I'm just going to start doing something on TikTok and, and Insta, as I've heard it's called, whatever, <laughs> so 
Is that, is that how it began? You just sitting there in your room, like, okay, I got to do something here. Pretty much. You know, I was very confused at first and frustrated with the amount of misinformation I was seeing. You know, some of these vaccines were just released. And so I myself didn't know what was true or what was not. So I took the time to really look into the science. And, you know, I did kind of realize and recognize early on that at a national level, young individuals weren't really being targeted on social media platforms with the right information. And so, you know, I saw a need to get that information out there. And that's pretty much what compelled me to start the COVID Campus Coalition. And I would say that's probably a sentiment that a lot of students across the country kind of share who have been seeing this information and things like that, because as a college student myself over the last year, it's been definitely very frustrating at times to see people kind of have a disregard for the information that they know that's out there um, and kind of the rules and regulations that are set out to protect themselves and others in the community. And so I think that kind of spreading this information is, I think people kind of forget that it's not only about them, but it's also about the communities that colleges are in and things like that. And so for a university like Santa Clara, we're in a big city. Um, and so our students also impact the surrounding people and the community. And that's something that I think a lot of students lose track of. Thank you so much, Amana and, and Jordan. So Jordan, you, you've been posting these things and surely you've gotten lots of reaction, feedback, conversations, et cetera. What would you say are the maybe two to three top, uh, I'll say misunderstandings or misconceptions that you find you've, had, you've dealt with over time with your peers at colleges and universities about the vaccines? I think one of the biggest ones, especially for young women, are fears about infertility. And that's one big myth that has been circulating since very early in the COVID vaccine rollout and something that we've been working to target and really help individuals understand that that is not a concern. It really just emerged from a rumor that was spread across Facebook. Another one that we've been hearing that's, I guess, more of a concern and or a misconception are concerns about long-term side effects or not fully understanding the mechanism of especially mRNA vaccines. So that's another place where we're really helping students understand the way that vaccines work. And the, you know, this vaccine, it had to go through a process of waiting two months before getting emergency approval from the FDA. The reason for that two month cutoff is because in all vaccines historically, any sort of reaction or side effect that could be potentially severe is caught during that, that time period. And part of that is just because of the way the vaccines work and their mechanism. So that is another area that we're helping students understand. And then finally, we've discussed this a bit, but I really think the biggest thing and misconception about these vaccines is that you know they're just meant for elderly individuals, or individuals that are immunocompromised and they're just impacting people on a personal level. I think that's the biggest misconception because these vaccines really do help protect communities, help protect our country and can ultimately help protect the world. They're the solution to help us end this pandemic. And I think a lot of young individuals aren't fully aware of that or don't fully understand it. So that's currently the greatest message that we're hoping to share and help young individuals understand. Can I pause for a moment on the fertility, infertility concern? Because I've heard that a lot. You mentioned college campuses. We had a conversation the other day with a physician who works with under-resourced communities in the San Jose, um, Santa Clara County area, a lot of migrant workers and others. And this, this notion is out among many. How do you respond to that? Jordan, a young woman comes to you and says, Jordan, I can't do it. It's going to affect my fertility. Like, what do you say? I absolutely go straight to the science whenever there are misconceptions about any matter related to COVID vaccines. So in this case, in the infertility case, this rumor basically emerged from, you know, a recognition that 
a part of the spike protein produced by the COVID vaccines shares a very, very, very similar, small similar part of genetic code with a part of a placenta protein. It's, it's, it's almost as if you know, you're comparing a cat to an elephant and people are concerned that your immune system thinks they're the same because they're both gray. That's kind of one analogy. Another way to look at it as two phone numbers that each contain the number nine somewhere in the phone number. And so initially this correlation was kind of made and people were concerned that your immune system might accidentally attack the placenta protein because it shares this really, really small piece of similar genetic code, but we have no evidence that that is true. And so just using the science that we know, the evidence and the studies that we have to prove that this is not a concern um, should hopefully help individuals understand and know that the vaccines do not cause infertility. In fact, there's no evidence that any vaccines as of now have ever caused infertility. You know, that's the, that would be my first question is what exactly about the vaccine is making you concerned? Because unfortunately this rumor just kind of emerged and spread like wildfire when really it's something that we shouldn't have been concerned with in the first place. The similarities between these two pieces in genetic code is very, very, very minuscule. Thank you so much. And I'm thinking, Amana, of your work with under-resourced communities. And I'm wondering, I don't want it to sort of go over to you if you had a question about that in terms of Jordan's work. Yeah, I think kind of an important thing um, that we kind of, um, I've noticed kind of in my research last year that, that a lot of those kind of um, things about fertility have been a common concern as well in kind of marginalized communities and conversations around that. And even now the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have spoken and recommended vaccines in all women, including pregnant women. And so I think one thing is that misinformation has been a huge issue in all groups, but especially in marginalized communities where there's this element of mistrust. And so I think my question for you is like, if you have someone from a marginalized community asking you kind of a similar question um, about kind of how to establish that trust with physicians and other scientists who are trying to combat this misinformation and help share the science. It's a really challenging issue. And I think it's something that we're facing, you know, in all realms of public health, because historically, you know, our history in terms of health disparities is very unfortunate. And so I think it's important to validate the uncertainty and the fears specifically in minority individuals. But I do think that then directing them and showing them just how many physicians, and um, I think specifically in these communities, if there are any people that they know who have been vaccinated, who are able to reassure them or tell them about their anecdotal stories, I do think that that is very effective just because you know many individuals do have mistrust in some of our health system. Um, and so I think that just directing them to a plethora of different resources, a plethora of different physicians and public health leaders, while also allowing them to interact with people they can relate with who have gotten vaccinated, who are also just everyday people and who are able to, you know, have children and live a normal life after getting vaccinated. Thank you so much. So um, we know we learned a little while ago, Jordan, that your university, Cornell University has, I'll use the phrase vaccine mandate. Um, our university, Santa Clara University, similarly. So this is applying all students, staff and faculty. The University of California system has mandated vaccination for everyone, staff, faculty, students. The Cal State University system, the largest university system, as I understand in the world, has mandated vaccination for all students, staff, and faculty. Do you think vaccinations are a good, a man, vaccination mandates are a good idea, Jordan? Yes or no, why, why not? I really do believe that strictly from a public health perspective, requiring vaccines to return to universities is a very effective way to prevent spread. And so, you know, we're hearing a lot of controversy about vaccine mandates, as we'll call it. And I think that we really need to remember that this is a public health crisis and emergency. And I do believe that in cases of public health emergencies, you know, 
um, sometimes we have to we have to take such measures, even if it might not be exactly our freedom or what we want. It's for the greater benefit of our communities. And I think in this instance, when we have the science and we know that these vaccines are safe, there's really no reason in my mind not to require vaccines to return, just to allow everyone to have the freedom to go to university in person and do the things that we love, interact with our friends without having to worry about catching COVID and allow individuals who are students and who might be immunocompromised or have disabilities that you know, make them feel unsafe without having those vaccines. So I do think it's effective and in most cases necessary. So you mentioned controversy around this. One piece of controversy is a Turning Point USA national organization uh, many members um, allied with uh, quite a few conservative causes in this country. Um, they have announced an effort to oppose vaccine mandates and requirements on college and university campuses. How would you respond to someone pushing that line of argument, Jordan? I think for starters, again, going back to the public health um, issue that COVID vaccines are, emphasizing to these individuals just how important COVID vaccines are and stating how they are a matter of public health and not a matter of politics is extremely important at this period of time. But I also think just in terms of the logic surrounding their argument, you know, in our society, our free country, we do have laws, we do have rules. If you want to drive a car at 120 miles per hour and a 40 mile per hour speed limit, that's a decision that could impact you, but could also impact other people and put them at risk. And so in order to protect people, we have this regulation that requires that you drive at a specific speed limit. I really think that COVID vaccines work similarly. You know, when we have these mandates in place, mandates, they are put there to protect communities and to protect people. And so by not by by being frustrated with a regulation or with a rule in place to keep our community safe, I don't think it's fully fair to pick and choose, you know, what we're allowed to restrict or you know what I mean, control at a national level for people's safety. So I think just really viewing these vaccines as a safety measure and a public health measure should hopefully help those individuals understand that, you know, I want freedom, we all want freedom. And so in order to have the freedom to stay open, to go to school in the first place, not go into lockdowns, these vaccines are what public health experts and doctors across the country think are the most effective. I would like now to uh, try to, um, it, well, to invite both of you to share with us, the elderly, the confused, uh, what have you, inviting both of you to speak as university students now. Okay, everyone's about to come back to campus. Most places are in person. Now everyone wants in person if we can possibly do it. People are gonna be meeting in their dorms in their rented houses and classrooms at frat parties football games you have it what are one to two to three ethical guidelines you could sort of pass on to each college student coming back to campus now in in this time of covid how should they approach their peers what are like mantras they can keep in mind to kind of guide those interactions. I'll start with you, Jordan, if you don't mind. Sure, you know, I really think just in general, in any conversations related to these vaccines between students, especially on campuses where vaccines are not required, always keeping an attitude of treating others the way you want to be treated is very important. I know people, especially young people, can get very heated and argumentative when discussing COVID vaccine, you know, controversies with one another, but I think that, you know, validating people's fears regarding vaccines, but providing them with the resources instead of getting argumentative is really one, one solution. And going along with that, you know, treating others the way you want to be treated, looking out for others and caring for our communities. I 
think that the way that we can really do that best is by getting vaccinated, but also taking other measures to help protect our communities and protect, protect our friends and people on our campuses, because we want to have fun, we want to socialize, but I think being cognizant of if you do for any reason experience any symptoms of COVID, getting tested, even if you're vaccinated, just because we are seeing that breakthrough cases are possible. You know, when universities put out any regulations or guidelines responding to the state of COVID on a national level, doing your best to really follow that advice, even if sometimes it might be challenging. Because I think that if we all work together, if we get vaccinated, if we wear masks when needed and really do our best to listen to the guidance, we can hopefully get back to a true normal as soon as possible where we won't have to worry about this at all. But for the time being, I think just really being cognizant of the state of COVID, getting vaccinated and doing what you can to protect yourself, but most importantly, protect others is super important in this time. Jordan, thank you. And Amana, how about you? Yes, I would say kind of the overarching kind of theme of all of this that I think we both kind of want people to take away from this is that it's not only about you, it's also about the community and the people that you're sharing these spaces with. And so I think um, one thing that's really important for students is to make sure that you're being honest with whatever conversations around COVID that are going on. Um, I think there's definitely kind of this element of shame that kind of comes with COVID sometimes, um, whether it's you were unintentionally exposed to COVID or something like that, that's something that people um, have kind of withheld that information in certain cases. And that really puts others at an even greater risk. Um, and so in that case, I would say a big thing for students is to make sure that you're being honest with the people around you. Um, and also kind of going along with that, um, and to piggyback off of what Jordan was saying, I think getting tested now, even if you are vaccinated is so important, whatever symptom you are feeling or anything like that, if you have any concern, um, I think the first thing you should do is get tested just to make sure that you're ruling that out before you are going anywhere or socializing with others or going to that frat party or anything like that. Because at the end of the day, your actions can put others at risk. Um, and so it's important to make sure that we are considering others as well as ourselves. And then kind of the last thing would be kind of make sure that you are following the guidelines that whatever university is putting out. Um, those guidelines have been put out for a reason. So whether, even if vaccinations are required at your university, um, if masks are also required, it's important that you are wearing your mask and following those guidelines. If you're not supposed to be going to other dorms and things like that, those rules are in place for a reason. And while they might um, inhibit you from doing those things that you might want to do at this time, it's because those activities might not be safe. Um, and so there is the thought process behind those things. And it's not just to stop students from doing whatever they want, but it's to protect the greater community. And that's important for students to keep in mind that it's not just about them. So thinking about how you want to be treated and others and thinking about the community and taking those two great big ethical nuggets from the wisdom that you both have shared. So um, Jordan, we have just a couple moments here. So. How can people get connected to the COVID Campus Coalition? Tell us how and what, what we have to do to do that. Great. So if you just Google COVID Campus Coalition, you will see our website. We have an apply section of our website. Just fill out that Google form and apply, and I will respond promptly with how you can get involved, whether that be opening a chapter at your university or joining a chapter or just helping out in general with the logistical side of things. We really, really want anyone who's interested in getting involved to have this opportunity to take leadership at your university and make an impact during this time. So for everyone listening, COVID Campus Coalition, you can find that website and go there. There's a, a menu option there, fill that out and Jordan's gonna get right back to you and you can get into join in this great work that she's been doing and others have been doing around the country on college and university campuses. And I think we could say in some ways now more important than ever, because we're all coming back and we've got the Delta variant and we all want to be together. We want to figure this out. So let's figure it out with the help of the COVID Campus Coalition. So 
Jordan Trelins, the founder of the COVID Campus Coalition, thank you so, so much for being with us today. Great to hear your thoughts, really inspirational, giving people a lot of ideas and all. So, yeah. um, and thank you, Aman Lidell, a senior at Santa Clara for being part of our conversation too. Um, we will have this uh, webinar posted, the recording posted shortly for sharing. And uh, we look forward to having you do that. And please also, everyone, we're having another webinar this Thursday, part of our Back to School series, a conversation with the San Francisco street artist Finch about using art and other modes of communication to persuade people to participate in social behaviors like vaccination. So please stay tuned for that conversation. So, Thank you so much for all of you listening in. Thank you again to Jordan Trelins, founder of the COVID Campus Coalition. Good day.